Hello everybody and a warm welcome to you from wherever in the world you happen to be. Um, welcome to this webinar entitled Heat Pumps, What Are They Really Like to Live With? My name is Torin. I'm an assistant manager within the Home Renewables team at Energy Saving Trust um, and I manage the green networks for homes and businesses. The purposes of this webinar is really just to give a little bit of background on um, heat pumps, um, installing them, living with the technologies, and how these alternative heating systems can help us reduce our carbon footprints inside our homes as well. The way the webinar will be structured is that I'll spend the first five to 10 minutes um, giving you an introduction to heat pumps and the Green Homes Network. I'll then hand you over to each of our three guest speakers who are Green Homes Network members uh, living with heat pumps, and they will each have around 10 minutes to share um, their story as well. And the last 15 minutes or so will be dedicated to a Q&A session um, at the end. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you've probably realized you can't see me um, and I'm not able to hear you, um, but as we'll have the Q&A session at the end, please feel free to submit questions via the um, questions window on your control panel. Um, and I'll try to keep an eye on those as we go through. And then we can try to cover as many as we can at the end. It's worth mentioning, um, there were around 400 people signed up to this webinar. So we're not expecting everyone to attend, but I can see that we have around 130 at the moment and we'll probably have more um, as we go along. So, um, it may be that we can't answer all of your questions today, but I'll, I'll point you to some extra resources at the end um, as well. So just to start off then with um, a little bit of an introduction to heat pumps. So heat pumps are basically heating systems that take heat energy from a variety of different external sources, um, like the air, the ground and water and they pass um, that heat energy to a heat distribution system in the form of, or typically in the form of radiators, um, underfloor heating, or a kind of air ventilation system. Heat naturally moves from hot to cold, but with a heat pump, uh, essentially, they use a refrigerant to make heat travel in the opposite direction for the purposes of heating your home. So whatever the original heat source um, for the pump, they all share the same kind of principles in terms of how they operate. And in terms of how they operate, um, I've got a diagram here. Apologies, it looks a, a little bit complex, um, but if you essentially just imagine that the left-hand side of the diagram is the outside of your property, the right-hand side is the inside, and heat energy is essentially moving from left to right. Um, so if we start on the left, the heat energy from the environment, um, whether that's from the air, the ground or the water, is absorbed by a refrigerant and that energy in itself is enough to make the refrigerant evaporate um, at a very low temperature. And that gas can then be compressed, increasing its temperature and pressure enough so that it can then exchange that energy with um, a suitable heat distribution system, as I mentioned, radiators um, or underfloor heating. And then that refrigerant then circulates around the system again um, and the cycle uh, repeats. So essentially the refrigerant is there to facilitate the transfer of heat from one location to the other, and that is from um, the outside, the heat source, to the inside. And really the amount of heat that the systems um, able to generate um, or the amount of heat that's distributed through the system uh, largely depends on how cold the heat source is um, and how warm you want um, your property to be. So that's a bit of a, an insight into heat pumps. I mentioned that our speakers today, our guest speakers, are from the Green Homes Network, so I just want to cover a little bit about that. The Green Homes Network is an online database of nearly 350 members from all across Scotland. Each member has a case study which follows their journey um, to creating a more sustainable home by installing various energy saving measures and renewable technologies. 
and each of their case studies essentially highlights um, what motivated them to take action, what types of improvements they considered, um, where they went to for advice and whether they received any um, funding, how they found the installation process and essentially how they benefited um, from making the changes to their property as well. Now, in terms of the uh, database of case studies, so we have an online library that you can access via the Energy Saving Trust website. You can essentially set um, filters by your location or the types of measures that you want to install. And you'll be presented with a list of relevant case studies. And you can then click into the case study, read a bit more about it, and even potentially request a visit from a member or request some more information via um, phone or, or, or email um, so that you can learn a, a little bit more about um, their journey to a, a more sustainable home. So really the Green Homes Network is just a very useful resource for people looking to install different types of technologies such as heat pumps um, just because it gives them real life examples of uh, living with the technologies. And speaking of real life examples, I would now like to pass over to our first guest speaker, John, who installed an air source heat pump. Um, so John, I will give you controls. There we go. Okay, thank you very much, Torin. Just try and move this on. Okay, so um, just a little bit of background and talk a little bit about uh, the rationale for change uh, that myself, my wife um, had. Um, first thing we really were trying to do was to reduce our carbon carbon footprint. Um, so we moved into a new house back in 2016 um, with our family, and we really wanted to. We were um, thinking more about environmental uh, issues, particularly uh, carbon in the atmosphere, and so we wanted to reduce our carbon footprint. In doing so, though, how we, we also wanted to make sure our bills were low. Um, we didn't want to. Uh, if we could reduce our bills, that'd be great. However, we would be prepared to pay a little bit more each month um, if, if what we were having as our heating system would be a, a greener solution. Um, and lastly, we were just curious, um, uh, would it be possible uh, to eliminate direct burning of fossil fuels from our lives? So to completely not have any burning of fossil fuels. Obviously, when you buy any kind of goods in the shop, there's a uh, indirect carbon footprint associated with those things, but could we eliminate that? So that was our, our rationale. So it was, it, it was a journey. Um, and this next slide um, just goes to our, it uh, shows you our steps that we took, our, what our, our journey was. So when we moved house, we changed to a renewable electricity company. Um, I think it's one of the ones which is now uh, no longer in business, but um, we're, that was our first step. Um, we had a, a, a colleague um, that I work with who had invested in an electric car and raved about it. And I was anxious about, like many people, about uh, how far it could travel without before charging it. But we took the plunge and uh, haven't really looked back. Um, we love our, our, our electric car. Um, these are all relatively easy steps, really. Um, then we installed some solar panels. Um, uh, and then the, the big step was uh, the, the heat pump. So we did this around um, late 2018. We first got in touch with Home Energy Scotland um, and got a report done. And we had our heat pump installed in 2019 to replace our um, very old gas boiler, which was making uh, unpleasant noises. Um, so that, that that was a big step because people weren't really talking about heat pumps so much um, back in 2018, 2019. But we, we thought this was a, a, a good technology which um, was renewable, was green. Um, and our final steps, we switched an induction hob. Um, that, that's probably the least successful aspect of our change. Uh, it's not quite as good as uh, cooking with gas, but there we have it. Um, and uh, we live in the country, and the transport we are is terrible. My wife and I both work, so we changed our second car to electric. So we, we don't burn any fossil fuels now, and that, that was really what we want, where we wanted to get to. Um, so the heat pump installation itself, uh, we've got a, an air source heat pump. It converts um, takes the heat out of the air and converts it to water. So we, we've still got radiators as normal, uh, as we had before, rather. Um, um, uh, so we, we had to change our, our radiators and hot water storage um, in the house. 
Um, so that, that just needs need to be done. Um, we were fortunate, however, to be able to retain our exist, existing pipe work. Um, so we had, I think it's uh, 10 or 12 millimetre pipes in the house we were in. It was a 2001 build, um, so the pipes are, were, were okay. Um, but we, we did an, install an additional pump on the system to pull the water around as well as push it around the, the radiators, and that works fine. Um, but you, it, it is essential to uh, increase the size of the radiators because the flow temperature from the heat pump is lower, so you just need more surface area of radiator in your house. Total cost was around £15,000, and we got a £10,000 loan from Home Energy Scotland Energy Savings Trust, and we're paying that back over 12 years, and we're fortunate as well. We, we applied to the Re Renewable Heat Incentive uh, Scheme, which is closing fairly soon. Um, so we're getting about £8,700 £8, over seven years in quarterly payments. That, that goes up every year with inflation, so it, it will in the end be a little bit more than that. Okay, so that was our installation. Um, a few things to consider. Um, so we were advised uh, that the installation is important um, when the Home Energy Scotland advisor came out. We had a 2001 build, so our house was okay, actually. Um, my, my mum also got a heat pump put in after we got ours, and she was, was in the 1930s, semi-detached. Um, but she'd already put in a cavity wall and new windows, so she, her house was also uh, fine, but that, that really needs to be done first. If, it, if your house is losing heat, then the heat pump's not going to be efficient. Um, retrofitting uh, can be problematic, so our, our house is 2001. Um, there's not much space under the floorboards. Um, in fact, it's not even floorboards. Um, um, it's about an inch. Uh, so actually putting in new pipework was going to involve a lot of ripping up of floors. Whereas in my mum's house, it was much easier. You could crawl under the floorboards. There was space to get underneath. And so um, when she got hers done, uh, she got new pipes. We decided it was um, too much disruption. Um, but as I say, it hasn't really been a problem uh, retaining the pipe work that we've got. Um, radiators are at a lower temperature, therefore they must be bigger. I mentioned that before. Um, and yeah, your pipe work. Sorry, pipe work may need to be replaced. If it's a uh, small uh, bore, then it probably will need to be replace, replaced. And the important bit, uh, observations. Okay, so our house is at a stable temperature. And what, what, what I mean by that is that uh, um, the, the, the radiators tend to be on in the background uh, at a sort of lower temperature, but more often, so the house just retains its heat at a constant temperature, whereas before you tend to get a very hot radiator brings the room temperature up high, then it drops off, and you get a sort of a cycle of hots and colds within the room. So the house temperature is even, although our upstairs, we've got a lower temperature from sleeping compared to downstairs, but it is pretty even. In terms of running costs, um, <clears throat> so we had a 2001 gas boiler, which I guess wasn't uh, super efficient, but um, uh, we, were, we were paying around £1,800 per year, um, and we're now paying around £1,500 per year in terms of our uh, um, energy costs. That's excluding, both those figures exclude the electric cars. I've, I've been able to take those out. Having said that, we've got solar on the roof so and, and the heat pumps, so I, I, it's hard to work out the, um, uh, the, the efficiency of the different systems. Um, in terms of how much renewable energy we get, um, our heat pump, uh, Solar panels, rather, our PV is generating around three and a half thousand kilowatts per year, which is great. But our heat pump is generating around eight thousand kilowatts per year. So obviously, you have to put energy into that to get it out. But we're getting uh, about eight thousand kilowatts per year out of our heat pump. Um, and the coefficient of performance is often quoted with heat pumps. It's usually quoted as being three, or the newer heat pumps at 3.5. Um, we, we're getting about 2.9 on average across across the year. Um, we're slightly lower than three, and we think that's because we use quite a lot of hot, a lot of hot water. We've got um, uh, young young kids, eight and five, so they have daily baths. So we use a lot of hot water, and the efficiency of heating your hot water is is lower than just a general heating of the house through the radiator so that's what that's what's pulling our, our, our coefficient down we think um, at the moment and that is that is me thanks for listening thank you very much john and i can see lots of questions coming in um 
already. So keep sending those in, and, and like I say, we'll we'll try to um, answer as many as we can at the end. Um, we've got a second speaker now, uh, Marion, who's got a ground source heat pump. So let me just pass controls over to you. Hello, everybody. I'll just try moving this forward then, Torin. Should work, might be a bit of a delay. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we have a ground source heat pump, which is a bit different, but um, we moved into this Croft house in uh, December 2015. Um, and the house isn't maybe as old as it looks as it was built in 2008 and it has underfloor heating up and down and reasonable insulation. Um, but it, the old boiler, which is, this is a bit of it here, um, was um, effectively like um, an electric, um, a hot water tank that then pumped water round the floors. Um, it had eight one and a half kilowatt elements in it and uh, we were on a tariff that was total heat, total control and uh, it, that meant you got cheap electricity at certain times of the day but uh, the effect of that was that you were only heating the floors for a short time um, each day and um, the house was cold unless you used an awful lot of electricity. Um, and we didn't want to use an awful lot of electricity, A, from the cost point of view and because we were trying to be green. So. We did a lot of research. We got a survey done by Home Energy Scotland. Um, we thought about it <laughs> and then um, we decided that we would go for a ground source heat pump. So let's just see, here we are. Um, so what we have is um, a snaky pipe um laid in a big uh, a pit that is about 500 square meters and you can see how wet it is it's wet and peaty and this is that's good for efficiency in that ground source heat pumps work well in a sort of watery environment better than in a, say a sandy soil um so this was actually ideal. You would normally have uh, stripes of dig out a, a sort of ditches and lay your pipe in that, but that wasn't possible in a very wet, boggy bit of ground. So we just dug a big swimming pool, um, which we had done by a, a local contractor with a digger in June, because if we tried to do this any other time of year, this swimming pool would have been full of water. And we laid the 500 metres of pipe ourselves, um, just making sure that the snakes are all a metre apart. Um, so, and then the, the other end of this, all this pipe work goes into this um, unit, which is in the cupboard that the old boiler was in. So that has the hot water tank inside it and it has the control panel on it. Um, so this is a called a six kilowatt Nibi ground source pump, um, which slightly alarmed me to start with because I thought six kilowatts sounds like quite a lot, but actually that's made up of 1.5 kilowatt compressor for the heating and the hot water. And then it, it has an immersion heater in case you need extra hot water. Um, 
in practice, the heating uses between 200 and 300 watts um, at any one time, and the hot water cycles on and off up to the 1.5 kilowatts. So um, it actually uses a very tiny amount of electricity. As John said, it, it runs a lot of the time in the winter. Although I've just checked just now and it's off just now because it's sunny outside and the house is up to heat, so it's not working just now. Um, and as I said, it, that the hot water's in there as well. So trying to get it to move forward again. Yes, here is our energy usage. So because we were on total heat, total control, um, that's a second meter. We know exactly what our energy usage was for heating and hot water before we put in the heat pump. And that is these three lines here. And then the heat pump is metered. So that is these lines here, which are the subsequent uh, two, two and a half years. And you can see there is a, a massive difference. So this is purely because of the efficiency of the heat pump. We are using about a third uh, less electricity than we used before. And um, the house is warmer, considerably warmer. Um, we, we run the house, we, we have the thermostat in the hall set at either 18 or 19 degrees um, and it's pleasantly warm most of the time. So we, we got rid of the uh, total heat, total control and changed to a single tariff so that we can use electricity whenever we want it. Uh, the electricity for heating and hot water last year in 2021 was cost less than 400 pounds just under 400 pounds um the capital costs of installing the system were about it was about 12000 pounds for the heat pump and a couple of thousand pounds for the groundwork um but the £12,000 will be covered by the renewable heat incentive. So that's paid out over seven years. Um, and um, obviously, we're saving a lot of money. Uh, I did a calculation that uh, at the current electricity costs, it's saving us nearly £800 a year. And obviously, if electricity costs go up, it will save us more. People ask about noise and our heat pump is in the house, not like maybe an air source one, which is outside. Um, but the heat pump is really not intrusive at all. We also have pumps that pump the water around the floor. Um, and you can you can hear uh, hum from them occasionally. Uh, but it's quieter in general. It's quieter than an oil boiler, um, which might be going away in your kitchen or somewhere in your utility room. Um, and the pumps don't run all the time. I'm a light sleeper, and they don't keep me awake. So uh, I think so. Noise is not a problem. Uh, as I said, the house is warmer, um, but we have a wood burner, which will light in the evening we have access to a lot of uh, free low carbon wood from trees that have already fallen down um, so we can top up and make the house very warm in the evenings downstairs is controlled by a single thermostat um, uh, but upstairs there are room thermostats so that you can turn the heat down in the bedrooms but have them it warm in the in the bathroom and shower room. And we leave the pump alone in the winter, but adjust the controls in the summer uh, just to 
to uh, reduce any heating activity in the summer. Because if the temperature drops outside during the night, the heat pump may well decide it wants to come on. So we would more or less tell it not to do that. Moving on, we are, we've been really pleased with the heat pump. It's, it's been great. Um, and then our latest uh, project to reduce carbon is this ground mounted uh, solar panel array, uh, which we put in in December. And we've also got a Tesla battery um, mounted on the wall outside so that the solar panel, and we also have an electric car. So this morning, because it's sunny, I've been charging up the battery, at, which will then run the house for the rest of the day, and also um, putting some into the electric car. Uh, so since it got sunny at the beginning of March, looks like this is working, but we haven't had it for very long to say very much. Um, but it's certainly quite capable of running the heat pump for most of the day. And that's me. Thank you very much, Marion. Very interesting. Um, and what I'll do now is move on to our third and final speaker, who is Don. And he's also got an air source heat pump. So, Don, you should have the controls. Okay. Th thank you, John. And hi, hi, everybody. Delighted to. Be able to join you all today and uh, share my uh, real life uh, heat pump experience. I'm just waiting for, see if my, we can change the slide here. Not so far. Not changing. Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Not defeated by technology. What prompted us to look at uh, uh, renewables for our, our family home? Well, we, we, we moved into a, uh, a mid-60s built conventional construction house, quite, quite a sort of sizable four bedroom, um, but it had on-peak electric heating uh, and some off-peak. Uh, obviously, that was fine in, in the days when it was built because the ideal in those days was an all-electric house. However, electricity became expensive. It had been intended that um, electricity was going to be too cheap to meter because it would all be uh, from nuclear power. However, that didn't quite happen, did it? Uh, so it was back in, so stuck in, in that time warp and it was time to consider uh, a new heating system. It didn't have any wet central heating uh, at all. So we were kind of starting from zero, but so we weren't quite in the same position as most people who will be thinking about this, uh, prompted either by a wish to, uh, you know, deal with um, sustainability or, or, or heating bills and so on. Um, we were, we had a, a kind of a, a, a open options to, to see what we would do next. Um, yeah, traditional built four bedroom detached house uh, needed a heating system. So how to do that sustainably and make it easier to heat. Uh, at the time, um, there were still feed-in tariffs. So the first thing we did was we got some solar volt, photovoltaic panels. Uh, and as I say, at that stage, they were quite expensive, but you did get quite a decent feed-in tariff, which we do still benefit from. But if you're thinking of uh, PV panels now, uh, they are a lot less expensive, uh, although you don't get the feed-in tariff. Uh, but the thought was get, get them in before the feed-in tariff disappeared, and then perhaps later that could be teamed up with an air source heat pump. Um, so we, we started off with, with, with solar panels, and that, that photograph there was really just to show you a typical overcast Scottish day uh, and I think that was early May when we were still getting about three quarters of the total power able to be generated by by solar photovoltaics, even in Scotland, even on an overcast day. So uh, that's, uh, you know, just to just kind of dispel what's a, a, a bit of a, a kind of um, automatic assumption that you can't do this in Scotland because it's always cloudy. Well, you still get, uh, depending on the degree of cloud, obviously you still get substantial heat, uh, energy rather from solar panels. So next slide, there we go. Um, we next moved on to an air source heat pump, but just to the photo on the right there is, uh, you know, when, when you get your photovoltaic panels up, which you don't have to have for a heat pump, of course, but it does team up well, uh, you get great advice, uh, as you do for heat pumps, from the Energy Saving Trust and Home Energy Scotland, uh, and it's not difficult to get to the stage where a couple of chaps are running up your roof with a, some 
you know, solar panels tucked under their arms, very lightweight things, clipping them on. And they've been there operating successfully for, I think, uh, nine years now uh, with no noticeable degradation. Uh, so a good long-term um, option. So we then started to look at uh, putting in a proper central heating system. Uh, why an air source heat pump? Well, firstly, uh, it's, it had then recently become much easier because planning legislation used to require that you uh, would have to go for planning consent because they were deemed to be uh, a, a, a source of noise. But they are in fact very quiet and so hence the legislation was changed and you don't need any uh, any procedures to, to fit one now. Uh, we realized we would qualify for the renewable heat incentive, uh, which currently is still available. Uh, and as has been explained earlier, I'll not go over that again, but for every kilowatt hour uh, you put in, in our case solar assisted, you get three kilowatt hours of heat out. So we sought advice from Home Energy Scotland about obtaining quotations from approved suppliers. They have a list of suppliers you can go to for, for tenders. Uh, and um, went through the process of having the house um, assessed to get an energy performance certificate and that then predicts uh, how much um, improvement you're likely to get by fitting your, your air source heat pump and if the improvement is sufficient and if your house is sufficiently in insulated and uh, will perform well enough then that opens the door for energy for, for uh, interest free loans which help with the cash flow and also for the renewable heat incentive. Uh, next slide, there we go. So installing the heat pump, um, photos there, you see the old storage heaters being removed sitting on the front lawn, a lot of pipe insulation appearing and uh, the installers worked out a, a very neat installation for us, that all the new pipe work uh, and there's more pipe work had to go in to move the um, water up, up, up to a new hot water tank in, in the loft which replaced the one that was previously in an airing cupboard. But that was all fitted into an existing pipe duct. So usually there's, there's a, a way of routing stuff through your house. Um, additional measures that we needed to qualify for air source heat pump funding included loft insulation. So that was topped up to 270 millimeters and cavity wall insulation was already installed. Um, we selected a company called Expert Heating Scotland to install the heat pump. Uh, and that's a Mitsubishi product, but it's in fact made in Livingston, which further reduces the carbon footprint. It's just a, a nice thought that uh, it, it's a locally made product uh, and it's been great. Total cost of the system for us was 11450 but if you subtract from that the cost of putting in an entirely new wet radiator system, which was needed anyway, um, that would probably have cost about 5500 and so if you subtract that, then the cost of the air source heat pump component itself is probably about 5,950 at that time. Um, and against that, we were getting renewable heat incentive of approximately 990 pounds for the seven years, which as you can see, comes up to a decent sum of 6,930, which really covers um, the heat pump um, installation. So that's really helpful. And, and the fact that the interest-free loans are there means that you never have to, you know, you have to put some deposits down first, but beyond that, um, money goes out every month to service your interest-free loan and money comes in from renewable heat incentives. So the cash flow uh, really works really well, which is good to know. Living with a heat pump, uh, it's a super quiet model. They, they, they term it, I think they're all quieter now. Um, so it occasionally whirs gently, doesn't run all the time. And uh, as you can see, that keeps the daffodils cool. So your daffodils will have an extremely long season. It blows cool air out. And if you want to plant alpines uh, in that part of the garden, that's just the thing. They're, they need about a meter to either side of free air and um, about um, you know, 400 millimeters behind. Uh, and just, just a, a location to suit yourselves in relation to your house and, and, and your garden. So it's a simple, well-tried technology. It saves traditional boiler maintenance costs, uh, contract costs, which, which are otherwise, you know, they, they build up. So that's important to factor into your costings. Um, we've improved our EPC energy performance certificate band from, I think it was D, up by two grades. So that's um, to C, and with a couple more things, it's on, it's on the edge of being B, which is very good for um, a, a substantial sized, uh, you know, four bedroom house. And you, you can see the unit itself is, is extremely neat. And the only other bit of kit that really comes into your house 
is uh, a new combined pressurized hot water cylinder which has the controls attached to it and we had that put in our in our loft so that's really neat and we you know gained an entire uh, cylinder cupboard uh, on the first floor um yeah the size of radiators has been mentioned it is a lower water circulating temperature but uh, we were quite sort of pleasantly surprised that um the radiator sizes are not excessive we had this sort of looming uh, image in our minds of uh, these massive radiators but in fact with we, we just have standard twin wall pressed steel radiators with a nice casing on them um, and there are two in the living room two in the dining room the ones upstairs in the bedroom because the heat loss calculations are done room by room uh, then the, every room's individual heat loss is calculated and because heat rises through the house uh, the radiators in the bedrooms are, are astonishingly tiny. I thought they must have made some mistake, but the ones in the bedrooms are. In fact, if I just go a slide back, uh, you will again see on the bottom right that is a radiator in in a bedroom, and it's only about um, a foot and a half square. You know, one of the nearly the smallest size that, that you get. So uh, that was quite an interesting aspect I hadn't expected. Uh, okay, oops, I'm going through to Q&A yet, sorry. <laughs> um, there we are, so very rewarding to know, and that's one of the key things, that we've done as much as we can to support CO2 reduction, whilst making the house much more readily heated and a cosy place. Uh, we finally installed, um, well, it's never finally, there's always more you can do, and we're looking at a, 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 possibly a Tesla battery just now, but uh, we installed a, a carbon neutral DEFRA approved British made, low emissions burly wood burning stove for additional coziness and uh, we installed two beagles and one here in front of the wood burning stove because they're, they're uh, a very sort of cozy feature as well but the beagles are not uh, available for there's no sponsored funding for for beagles or indeed for the uh, wood burning stove but an interesting aspect of that is that if we do put the stove on in the evening it actually switches off even on the cold night we had recently um, switches off the air source heat pump because that's enough to for it to decide, well, uh, there's, uh, you know, the, the, the heat is now all from from another source, and, and so effectively your 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 wood is paid for, <laughs> or uh, there's no additional cost in, in running your, your your stove if you like that as a feature. Um, so I think that's those are the main points. Um, yeah, well, and a uh, little little anecdote. I always had to used to have complaints from my daughter when we had a, an electric shower. That dad, that that shower is absolutely hopeless. You can't get the detergent, you get get the shampoo out of your hair. You know, there's no pressure. And I was always reassuring her that it's the best possible electric shower you could get. Nothing wrong with it. Um, but I, I never convinced her. However, once we got this uh, air source heat pump in, it means that all of your water is a pressurized system, the hot and the cold. And I had a spontaneous uh, compliment from her one day when she came down and said, "Dad, that shower is amazing, really great." <laughs> so that was that was a good further endorsement. Um, you're making uh, a good move towards energy independence and sustainability. Um, in terms of what's it like to live with, really easy to live with, easier than than a gas boiler. And in these terms, we don't have a maintenance contract. That heat pump has been running for seven years with absolutely no um servicing required you can get maintenance contracts if you wish but my view on that is well you, do you have a maintenance contract on your fridge well no because it's, it's a really simple piece of kit and this is really a reverse fridge uh, and so it has proved to be very reliable and i do tempt fate uh on facebook sometimes uh once a year and post that my i've, I've been very concerned that my maintenance budget was was blown by 200 percent this year for my air source heat pump because I had to use two pieces of kitchen towel to wipe down the casing and I'd only budgeted for one. So I think that gives you an idea of how reliable and, and simple they are. Um, so that I think it would be, these would be my main points. Delighted to take questions as part of the Q&A later on. Perfect. Thanks very much, Don. Um, yeah, and I can see lots of compliments coming in about your lovely beagles as well. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for showing them. Um, okay, what I'll do now, let me just take back control. So yeah, we'll move on to our Q&A. So if I could possibly invite all of our speakers um, to turn on their webcams. Um, 
and let me just have a little look. So we did have lots of questions coming in, which is great. A um, couple of things I'd, I'd just like to cover, just kind of picking up on um, some of the comments that kind of came through. Um, in terms of finance, um, RHI, the Renewable Heat Incentive, is closing to new applicants uh, at the end of March. Um, but Scottish Government will continue to offer their HES loan scheme um, with uh, quite a high level of cashback. I think it's it's up to 75% the heat pumps currently. Um, that will continue to be offered um, until 2023. So despite the RHI coming to a close, there is still that kind of slight um, uh, offsetting um, there as well. Um, in terms of kind of controls, there's a few comments about um, setting the controls. Ideally, if you go through an MCS certified installer to get a heat pump installed, um, they should set you up um, with the heat pump and kind of talk you through um, how, how to run it um, efficiently. And then I guess there is a bit of a kind of working out um, what, what's the, the best way for, for your circumstances. Um, but yeah, that, that should kind of be packaged under the installing um, the, the heat pump um, kind of process. A um, couple of questions in terms of costs. Um, there was a question for you, John. Um, the £15,000 that you mentioned, um, does that include the new pipes and the new radiators that you had to get installed? <laughs> Yeah, yes, so we didn't change our pipe work, but we, it, that was inclusive of all the new radiators and the heat pump and new boilers. That, that was everything, yeah. It was actually, I just checked, it was actually 14,300. Um, just I couldn't quite remember exactly, but yeah, so, so not <laughs> quite 15,000. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, and what, John, just, just keeping with you there, what um, temperature do you have your system set at? You mentioned it's kind of colder upstairs, warmer downstairs. What? Yeah, so downstairs is actually about 20 and upstairs is about 19, 19.5 where we, where we sleep. I think it's been actually probably close to 19 upstairs. Okay, and Marion, you, you mentioned similar, you set it to kind of 18 or 19 um, degrees. Um, Don did yeah, mention just, about... Sorry. Just I should have said, Torin, or we, I think Don and I should have said that the, our, you don't need to have a wood burning stove to increase the heat. You could just get the heat pump to heat the house a bit more. But as I said, we we run it uh, maybe a bit cooler because we know then if we want to, we can have extra heat. But we could easily run it a bit um, warmer and not need the wood burning stove. And, and did yeah. you say that you run it 24 seven or you just have it for kind of set periods? the wood burning stove or the, the the ground source no the ground source we just leave it um to to uh sort itself out it's set up um yeah. so it it will cycle on and off if it's if it's um if the house is up to heat um it will just cycle off yeah, we're, we're, we're the same uh, we just left it set the way the installers had it which is 24 hours and it just looks after itself. Um, we have it set to 19, but it seems to constantly deliver 20. So we could actually notch that down to 18 and it would deliver 19, but it's always a bit warmer and, you know, it's designed to be a little bit warmer in the living room and dining room. Um, but yeah, just, uh, you know, really simple, simple controls. It, it may sound like a, a sort of, you know, an innovative bit of kit that might be a bit daunting, but your thermostat is just a, a, a wireless item that you can either screw to the wall or carry around and put where you want it. And um, it just has temperature up, temperature down, and a picture of a suitcase. If you're going on holiday, you can press the suitcase. <laughs> That's it. And it also has an app so that if you forget to press the suitcase as you drive around the city bypass, uh, you can press the suitcase on your phone. Yeah, but we've never found that useful. Uh, but they, 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 all the technology can be there, yeah. And, and I've actually done that. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just ask if, if um, so if you are setting the, the heating and, and, and it kind of just comes on when it um, when it needs to, how how does that work if, if you are kind of, I don't know, opening windows and trying to ventilate the property a bit more? Have you ever had experiences where you've significantly had to boost the amount of heating that you're using because you have 
had the windows open because I don't know you've been cooking or you know drying clothes or that type of thing. The the thing that I notice is it's not so much opening windows, but when it's windy outside, that definitely takes the heat away from the house. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it works harder. Automatically it works harder. So you use more electricity on the days when it's windy. Um mm -hmm. probably more so than it just being cold and frosty. Um that that's quite an interesting one. Um, we've, you know, done what obviously you should do to effectively draft proof the whole house, and we think we've, you know, you, you can't find a, a, a wee jet of cold air coming in anywhere. But having said that, there must be sufficient, you know, it's not a huff house, it's not totally sealed. So there is sufficient infiltration and, and air going through it still. Uh, it would appear to not cause any problems. You know, we don't have condensation, we don't have. Because if it was maybe if you burn the toast, you open the window in one room, keep the door shut to the kitchen, that sort of thing, and it's not going to make much difference. But uh, yeah, um, and it's an interesting comparison with when these 1960s houses were built. They had an air brick in every room and wind whistling through the whole house mm -hmm. because there was this huge fear of, of dampness. You know, everybody had come from damp slums, and so the modern houses all had wind whistling through them. <laughs> so that was the first thing you could do is block up the air bricks, but they were just everywhere. And having done all that, a modern house is is quite well sealed. Um, we put some insulation under the floor um, and sealed up any sort of tongued and grooved gaps that there were around services, and that sort of thing where service pipes come up. This is worth delving into pipe ducts and making sure everything is is sealed up. Uh, but yeah, um, ventilation doesn't seem to be an issue. Uh, I suppose when the wind is howling. Uh, there must be a bit more infiltration, but it just seems to be just about right. And I wouldn't want it any more sealed because if you seal the house any more than that, you're, then you're into mechanical ventilation and uh, air conditioning and that sort of thing, which is an interesting point because the Swedes actually do that, I believe, in their houses. If they have a totally sealed house, then you have to have ducts and uh, heat exchangers mm -hmm. and lots of things. Uh, in fact, they, we, I took so a group of Scandinavians around one of our schools here, which is proudly very green, but with sort of supplemented natural ventilation controlled by IT. Uh, and and they, they were horrified that there was natural ventilation involved. Uh, this, this is terrible because all ours are completely sealed and they have uh, mechanical ventilation, which seems to me, as after a pandemic, even more so, uh, not necessarily a, a, a good thing. So, mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Just, just kind of sticking with, um, I guess, external factors potentially influencing how, how you're using the heating system. Um, Marion did mention that even with kind of frost and stuff, obviously with the ground source heat pump, um, it doesn't really affect um, the kind of the amount of heat that you're able to generate um, as, as much as you maybe expect. Um, but I'm just wondering if, if when you have the system installed, are you given any, I don't know, guidance or, or any kind of paperwork that says the system should operate at, you know, up to this temperature or down to this temperature? Um, you know, external air temperature or, or ground temperature. Do you do you get any kind of information on that? Do you are you aware of of when your system maybe might not be optimum or? Brian, yeah, you about to... on, you, on you go. Okay, I was just going to say, we, yeah, we we got general guidance, and you know, your background information tells you that uh, providing you're not. A, physics absolute zero of minus 275 degrees there's energy out there so although it's counterintuitive and they, uh, you will get heat even when it's minus 15 or or more uh it does still work and the beast from the east i think proved that for us uh yeah so we we, we got that information it wasn't so sort of specific or empirical as to what the what the limits you know technical limits were but just the general reinsurance that you can be minus quite a lot and you will still get heat from from your air source heat pump, and certainly from your ground source more so. I would have thought it must be more efficient than if it's ground source. Yeah, I, I can I come in on that as well. We we were told that it could go down to minus twenty, but um, it's a false assumption that gas boilers can go down to minus twenty. They tend to pack in when you go down that will. And for Thank us, you. we you um, bury the pipe. Uh, at, at least 1.2 meters deep. So mm -hmm. in our climate, it's unlikely that you're going to have any kind of frost down to that level. But they do quite careful calculations um, about the 
the amount of pipe you need because you do cool the ground around where the, the pipe work is. The stuff coming mm. out of the house can be at a minus temperature. So mm. you make sure that you don't have your outgoing pipes right next to your incoming pipes. Um, you need a wee bit of care with that. Um, also, where ours is, it's on a south facing. I mean, we're in the Highlands in Fort William, but we're it's south facing and it does get sunshine. So the uh, the boggy ground get, does get heated up in between times. Um, and we were told there were, you're unlikely to have any problems with uh, you know the, the it not working because of the cold temperatures outside. Mm -hmm. So one one final question. I'm just looking at, at, at the clock there. Um, Don, you did mention that that maintenance is is pretty much a non-issue um, for for your air source heat pump. Um, I don't know whether John and Marion, you could you could maybe um, talk to us if if there's been any kind of maintenance issues or um, or anything in the time that that you've had your systems. I've not had any problems. I mean, we get it. We do get it maintained once a year. We get some to have a look at it just to check that it's still operating efficiently. But there's really been no problems with it whatsoever. I mean, it's not. It's not new technology. It's old technology, and it's. It's as, as Don said. It's actually very simple technology. Yeah. Our one, we it was a local installer who who put ours in, and we get him to come once a year. Uh, to check it and the only thing that we've needed to do was to top up the fluid in the pipes in the ground um, because obviously when you first pour it in you get some air bubbles and things over 500 meters of pipe um, and then as it's pumped round it, it sort of gets rid of that but uh, we did have to top, top up that was the only thing he's had to do so far Interesting. Uh, one, one thing that hadn't occurred to me until uh, there was a nearby lightning strike <laughs> was, is this considered to be standard kit and part of your house and therefore will insurers pay for it if something gets damaged? Uh, say about four doors away, somebody somebody's chimney was hit by lightning, chimney landed on their bed, they weren't in the bed happily, uh, but it blew a lot of electrics in the surrounding area, including quite a few of ours, and it blew our inverter for the solar panels. So at that point I thought, oh, oh my goodness, that's an expensive bit of gear. Um, I could just hear the insurer saying, oh, you didn't tell us about that. That's expensive. Oh, we will not be, we'll not be paying for a new one of those. But not at all. Uh, they did pay for that. And they regard anything of that sort as bolted to the house as part of, of your house, part of the insurance. And that the same, I imagine, would apply to uh, an air source heat pump and the kit that goes with it. So not one that we'll have to all worry about much, but it establishes the principle, I think, that insurers uh, do cover this as part of the house. It's not so exotic and new. It's only new and exotic to us in Scotland because we hadn't really heard of them, whereas they're all over Germany, Europe, Scandinavia. Uh, but we've had cheap gas for so long that we've uh, not really discovered them until, until recently. Yeah. So that, that's a good point of reassurance, I think. Yeah, it definitely makes sense in terms of insurance covering a, a key aspect of just being able to live at a property. So, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. OK, um, well, that brings us to the end of, of the Q&A. Um, apologies if we weren't able to um, to get to all of your questions there. Um, but I'll, I'll just close up with a final slide or maybe some next steps. Um, so we've had Home Energy Scotland's number, free phone number, I should say, um, at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so, yeah, if you do want to speak to a renewable specialist about installing one of these technologies, um, they would certainly be a, a, a good organisation as a, as a good starting point. Um, that's, sorry, I should say that's only if you live in Scotland. Um, but yeah, their advice is, is free and impartial um, and it's funded by the, the Scottish Government as well. Um, you could also go onto the Green Homes Network um, and find some similar members to the ones that you've heard from today. Um, and maybe arrange to go and visit their property and, and see these technologies um, in situ. Um, you can also um, go onto the Energy Saving Trust website. There's a lot of resources on there. Um, we also have our Heat Pump Heroes. Um, I think that's on the Home Energy Scotland website, actually. Um, but that's just five other people that have installed um, heat pumps um, that are quite willing to, to talk about their technologies. But yeah, really, there's a lot of resources on the Energy Saving Trust website. There's a uh, an installation checklist as well. So if you are at the point where you're, you've kind of been 
um, you're committed um, to installing one of these technologies, then there is an installation checklist um, that will help you to kind of decide whether you're asking the right questions and whether you're receiving the right information um, and, and paperwork um, from your installers um, when you go to do that. So I just want to close up today by thanking all of our um, guest speakers. Um, it's been a great pleasure having you on. Um, and I think it's been really important to share your first-hand accounts um, of, of what you've done to your properties. So I do wish you all the best with your future projects as well. Um, it sounds like there's there's always kind of room to to maybe go go further and, and improve your carbon footprint. But hopefully everyone that's, that's attended today has really benefited um, from, from kind of all of the points that you've made. And I would say that the webinar, um, recording of the webinar will be up on our YouTube um, website as well. So if anyone has registered today to attend, um, you'll get an email shortly with a link to that YouTube um, video once we, once we have it uploaded. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your week. Bye for now. Bye.